respect for President Xi. But we have a trade deficit. It is the largest deficit of any country in the history of our world. It's out of control. It was a moment that shook global markets. You know, look, if there was going to be a trade war, I can tell you, Jessica, the markets wouldn't really like it. A trade war between the world's two largest economies. Now five years since the start of tit-for-tat tariffs on vital American and Chinese goods, is there an end in sight? So when will the trade war end? The trade war may never end. Number one, but this is the first of many. This was the moment the U.S.-China trade war started to build steam. This has been long in the making. You've heard many, many speeches by me and talks by me and interviews where I talk about unfair trade practices. But we have one particular problem, and that's China. The year before, the two countries had recorded an enormous amount of bilateral trade. But it was a relationship that then U.S. President Donald Trump called massively lopsided. Trump was singularly focused on America's trade deficit, or the measure showing U.S. imports from China far exceeding its exports there. For many years, countries have been taking total advantage of the United States on trade. He had a solution. More than 300 billion U.S. dollars worth of tariffs on Chinese goods that Trump said would rebalance bilateral trade. President Trump is the guy who said trade wars, they're good and they're easy to win. Giddy up, Mr. President, show us how. Five years later, how did it all work out? I think there was very little good done. Why? Take a look at these two charts. This was the U.S. trade deficit with China in 2017. And here it is in 2022. Uh, Trump's objective was to reduce the U.S. trade deficit in general and with China. Uh, that's clearly failed during this trade war. Uh, in the U.S. trade with China, we, we've imported more from China in 2022 than ever before. And the trade imbalance with China is larger than ever before. So the stated objective, none of that was met, basically. Complete failure. Part of the reason it went wrong is that even one-sided tariffs tend to work both ways. The U.S., by imposing tariffs on Chinese imports, also caused the price of its own exports to rise. Why? It's because of what the U.S. imports from China. I think here there was a misunderstanding. We all see so many Chinese products, you know, at Walmart, Target, whatever, that we probably have the impression that most of what we import from China are final goods. And we do import a lot of final goods, shirts, sweaters, footwear. But the majority of what we import from China is actually intermediate goods. That is, it goes directly for businesses for use in their production process. Then there's the fact that tariffs are rarely one-sided. China imposed its own trade policies in retaliation to Trump's tariffs. Most of the tariffs imposed by China targeted American industries that relied heavily on the Chinese market, products like tobacco and soy. Many of these American industries were concentrated in areas that are home to some of Trump's biggest supporters. I'm thrilled to be here in Ohio with the hardworking men and women of Lima. Uh, so China very predictably came in with retaliatory tariffs. They import a lot less from the U.S. than we import from them, so it was a smaller volume, uh, but it included some important products, you know, soybeans and some other agricultural products. China's tariffs on U.S. agricultural exports were suspended in 2018. A 2020 deal between the two nations also promised to rebalance trade, 
with China committing to buying additional U.S. imports, amounting to 200 billion U.S. dollars more than 2017 pre-tariff levels. But fast forward to today, and what about that promised billions worth of new trade? It's nowhere to be seen. Meanwhile, the two nations continue to drift further apart. So now it's a, it's a more uh, total war, not only an uh, economic war. So we see the real danger. We even see the real danger for the two countries to be engaged in a physical war. Yeah. In China, the economic impact of U.S. tariffs is difficult to separate from another massive drag on the domestic economy, the pandemic. I think you can see well, well clearly for more than 10 years, China's GDP is go down, go down, go down. China's annual GDP growth slowed in the years immediately following the start of the trade war, only to settle at 3% in 2022, less than half of what it was the year before. It was one of China's lowest GDP growth rates in five decades. The U.S. Uh, policy failed. It, is, it failed to constrain China's capacity. Uh, so in the past five, five years, uh, if we don't, if we didn't experience uh, the pandemic, uh, actually uh, the our export capacity will be uh, stronger. Uh, definitely. Of uh, exports of certain Chinese goods to the U.S. side has been affected, but generally we haven't seen a drastic decline of Chinese export capacity. Chinese exports to the U.S. of goods targeted by tariffs like IT hardware fell, but exports of non-tariffed consumer products remained stable. For many U.S. manufacturers, the tariffs on intermediate goods from China amounted to a domestic tax on all manufacturing industries that were highly reliant on the Chinese supply chains. And in China, while trade with the U.S. suffered, trade increased with the rest of the world, notably with Russia and Southeast Asia. Uh, the tariff on Chinese goods now is hurting the American companies, uh, American businesses, and American consumers. Everyone can see that the trade war is hurt China a little, but it hurts the U.S. a lot. A joint study by Dartmouth University and the University of Hong Kong found that approximately 2.5 percent of China's population suffered job loss and lower wages as a result of the U.S. tariffs. Most of those affected worked in China's manufacturing sector and were hurt by lower demand following the U.S. tariffs. Now a new raft of tariffs passed by Trump's successor, Joe Biden, threatens to hit the Chinese economy even harder. The latest tariffs are imposed on high-tech U.S. exports to China in an apparent bid to slow Beijing's technological rise. The Biden administration has imposed U.S. export restrictions on advanced semiconductor chips and high-tech manufacturing equipment to China, a move that many see as having far more impact than the Trump-era trade tariffs. I think the Biden team is more focused on China as a strategic threat. They've laid that out clearly in a national security strategy. Uh, they see China as the main long-term threat to the United States. Uh, and so the Biden administration on policy is mostly aimed at preventing technology transfer to China or preventing technological advance in China. Before I came to office, the story was about how the Re People's Republic of China was increasing its power and America was failing in the world. Not anymore. We made clear, and I may give my personal conversations, which have been many, with President Xi, that we seek competition, not conflict. But I will make no apologies that we're investing in, to make America stronger. Investing in American innovation and industries will define the future that China intends to be dominated. The chip-making export restrictions could set the Chinese tech industry back a decade, according to some experts. And China become almost totally unable to get strategic high tech. 
and whatsoever from advanced countries, especially from the United States, but not only that, from all and advanced industrial countries. Actually, uh, U.S. is no longer the uh, the leading producer of uh, semiconductors, uh, but they want to build uh, a circle, yeah, a closed circle, yeah, including U.S., Japan, uh, China, uh, Taiwan, and uh, South Korea. Biden's policy is also focused on decoupling the American and Chinese economies. Developed industrial countries, especially the United States, so many people hate this globalization. So many people perceive this liberal globalization only benefit with two guys, China and Wall Street. For decades, China's massive manufacturing industry made deep connections with economies around the globe. But as the world becomes increasingly polarized into two camps, the U.S. and its allies are looking for ways to divest from China. So other countries are interested in reducing their reliance on China. South Korea, for example, set up a fund to move um, that would help some companies move plants back to South Korea. The Japanese had a particularly interesting approach. They were willing to provide subsidies to companies to move to other parts of ASEAN or Asia. Even the most well thought out efforts to decouple the economies of China and the U.S. often miss the fact that in a globalized world, not all products offered by Chinese companies are actually made in China. Yeah, I think decoupling from China is completely unrealistic, you know, unless the U.S. really wants to decouple from the world. You know, you know, there are lots of interesting examples. You know, I like to cite the example of solar panels. You know, we used to import a lot from China, and then we slapped this 250% anti-dumping duty. So we import no solar panels from China, uh, but we mostly import them from Vietnam and Malaysia and they typically are produced by Chinese companies. In early April 2023, the International Monetary Fund predicted rough seas for the global economy if the trade war continued to intensify. An IMF report said China and its allies in Southeast Asia will be hit in the near future as developing nations face choices of which country to align with more closely. U.S. allies in Asia, like South Korea, would fare better in the future, but overall costs will likely go up as the U.S. and its allies shift investment and attention to countries unable to match China's scale and low costs. I, I don't see a winner, I don't see a loser. Uh, globalization has a history of only uh, some 30 years, and uh, certainly in the process we will see uh, we will see uh, many problems. So now we see the U.S. government actually they are in uh, they are also in a very difficult time. They want to decouple with China so that uh, some uh, supply uh, supply chains can uh, could uh, go back to the United States. But actually, we we don't see that. I, I worry in the current environment that people take a lot of the benefits of globalization for granted without appreciating you know, that it's globalization that's delivering this efficiency and this living standard. So it, people in the U.S. are talking very casually about we should decouple from China. You know, I mean, if you're serious about that, it's going to have a very negative effect on living standards uh, and not just in the U.S., probably the whole world. But to me, the question is, which direction are we going in? Are we going toward a more open world or are we going in the opposite direction?